started. Uh, thank you for joining us today. To start the meeting, I'm going to hand, hand it over to Dean Bugai, who is the Associate Director of Children's Behavioral Health. Thanks, Dean. Thanks, Jessica. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, so much for you joining us today. Um, we're excited to be talking with you, you know, really about making some, you know, I think really good developments um, and modernizing our therapeutic foster care um, policy and also reimbursement and also looking to, um, you know, add an additional layer of services through the evidence-based uh, treatment foster care Oregon program and bringing that uh, really kind of back to Maine because it's something that uh, used to exist, I think, a number of years ago that was really focused on DOC-related uh, youth. And, um, you know, now we're looking to really, you know, bring that back in earnest um, and support uh, youth across the behavioral health system. So as we continue to look at the various um, you know, uh, levels of care, um, supporting youth uh, with different acuities, supporting youth in home-like environments. You know, we're, we're recognizing that um, we want to make, you know, some revisions and updates, you know, to our models. And uh, along with that is rates. And so, um, you know, we've been working, you know, I think pretty, pretty hard um, uh, working to, uh, you know, come up with the models and um, you know, I think we're gonna have a good presentation um, for you today on all of that. So I thank um, everyone associated with Ming Care and with my team and um, you know and, and with child welfare, you know, working collaboratively on this work. And I appreciate every one of you here today to hear about it. Um, please do, you know, uh, ask questions and, you know, think about what your comments will be, because this is just really the beginning of, you know, the process as this uh, public engagement uh, uh, presentation. And uh, we will continue to work together to, you know, I think, uh, you know, put together some some you know really good policy to bring these services um, and expand these services um, you know and, and availability for youth so uh, with that Jessica I'm going to hand it back to you and um, we will get along with the presentation thanks thanks Dean uh, at this time I'm going to have the people who will be presenting and their backups introduce themselves uh, we'll start with you Dwayne I'm Dwayne Parsons. I'm the acting uh, manager of rate setting. Alina? Hi, I'm Alina Smith. I'm a manager with Children's Behavioral Health. David? Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm David Jorgensen. I'm the uh, director of data analytics and rate setting for Main Care. Um, and I just want to uh, echo what Dean said and um, uh, reiterate uh, our thanks for the important work that you all are, are doing uh, in our foster care system. Thank you, David. Um, Rebecca? I'm um, Becky Richardson. I'm a regional associate director at OCFS, and I also oversee our foster care um, licensing program. Thank you. And I'm Jessica Levesque. I am the project manager in the rate reform unit, and um, project manager on this study. As Mandy brings up the slide presentation, I would like to remind everyone that this meeting is being recorded and that we will send out a notice with this recording link in the notice along with a link to the PowerPoint presentation. We also, I will put the website link into the chat today so you can check that as early as today, tomorrow, so you can have access to this information. It will be posted as soon as it's available, even if you haven't received the notice. So I will go ahead and post that during this presentation. I also, it's helpful to us if you would introduce yourselves in the chat so we know who we have on our call. And again, thank you for um, joining us today as we do our presentation. Um, we will hold questions to the end and we have allotted for time for questions and comments at the end of the presentation. However, if you think of something while we're presenting, feel free to put it in the chat and I'll read it out loud at that time. Thanks. Today's agenda, we will go through the rate determination process and scope, the background of therapeutic foster care, what the service model review process overview and details are, the proposed rate and rate model, 
and we'll have that time for questions and comments, and then we'll move on to immediate next steps. Next, oh, thank you, Mandy. <laughs> um, this process is part of our new public law 2021 chapter 639, which was took effect in August of 2022. This process establishes um, for the rate determination process includes a stakeholder engagement and public presentations, which we're having today. And you'll see the draft rate model that gives you an opportunity to also do a written comment process, which we will compile all the comments and then we write a written response to that and then they get posted on our website page. Same website that I referred to that you will be able to find the PowerPoint presentation and the recording. Then following the determination, this also includes the formal map of rulemaking process, which you will have an additional opportunity for public comments at that time. It's, it's the end of that process. So today's meeting, we're gonna, so today we're having our meeting. We're gonna ask that you submit those written comments by December 20th this year that we will then compile and post like I had stated. Um, at that time, after we've reviewed your comments and questions, there's an opportunity for us to review and make any adjustments uh, to our model or our methodology. And then we are um, targeting fall of 2024 for the MAPA rulemaking process. Rulemaking. Next slide. At this time, I'm going to hand this presentation over to Alina. Good morning. Um, we want to provide some um, background onto some of the policy changes that are coming. Um, I do want to be clear that we're providing this so that you can understand the rate. Um, we're not prepared to discuss all the ins and outs of exactly how all of this is going to work going forward. Um, but in order to understand sort of what the rates are, we do need to sort of go over um, the current plan. So there's a lot of information and I'm going to have to go pretty quickly to get this all covered, um, but you will obviously have access to this afterwards. So the um, the current approach um, is currently in section 97. Um, you can read it there. Our plan moving forward is to have two distinct service models, therapeutic foster care, um, which is for children in the department's care and custody um, under age 21. Um, and we'll get more into sort of the levels of care in a minute. And the second model is the therapeutic intensive homes. And so this utilizes the therapeutic foster care Oregon um, evidence-based model. This is for any child, does not have to be in department custody under 18 um, who are at that level of need. Next slide. So just sort of comparing the two models, um, again, the major, there's a, um, the therapeutic intensive home is a much more intensive model and, and for the higher behavioral needs and developmental needs, it's also, again, does not require the youth be in state custody to utilize that model. Therapeutic foster care is for the moderate behavioral health and developmental needs for youth um, who are in state custody. Um, next slide. So when we're talking about therapeutic foster care eligibility, um, to, to be eligible for therapeutic foster care, you need to be under 21 and in the care and custody of the Department of Health and Human Services. We're going to use the tool, the calocus CASI um, suite to sort of demonstrate the appropriate level of care. Um, all the regular licensing rules for therapeutic foster homes will sort of maintain um, as far as the number of youth available. So you'll have your two therapeutic placements just as you do now. Um, following again, the existing rules. Next. For the therapeutic foster um, care intensive, I'm sorry, still the therapeutic foster care model of care. Sorry, excuse me. Um, again, we're gonna do the calocus Cassie scoring within 30 to 60 days of entering care. There is that time gap because there is some record gathering that needs to happen. Um, this process will include a team, including the youth when appropriate, to provide information to the independent agency. They're going to gather the information, they're going to do the scoring, and then there will be a readout of the score to the group at the follow-up meeting. Um, this tool does allow for clinical discretion and scoring and accounts for trauma. Um, 
And so OCFS, which includes both child welfare and children's behavioral health, can then utilize those scores to help make sure the children get appropriate other services as well. So the score, the, the goal is to use this tool sort of across both children's behavioral health and child welfare. Next slide. So to put the sort of current levels of foster care in, um, in comparison to what it sort of will look like now, we're making obviously no distinctive changes to A and B. We're going to move from letters to sort of numbering. Um, therapeutic foster care will now combine what were level C and D into a new level three. Children being served in level E will be served in intensive therapeutic homes and level E will be the new level four. Again, other children who are high needs as well may access that level four service, which is the therapeutic intensive homes. Next slide. So who is on a therapeutic foster care team? You're gonna have a program manager, um, a therapist team lead, a case manager, a skill builder, a visit supervisor, as well as your therapeutic resource homes. Next slide. Um, the expectations, I'm gonna go pretty quickly through these, these slides. Again, you'll have access to them. Um, the team leads responsibilities essentially to lead the team, although we did provide some spelling out of exactly sort of what that um, guidance will be and sort of the requirements of that position. Um, they will be attending the child welfare FTMs. They may need to testify and their job really is to sort of run this team. Next slide. The case manager's responsibility is to facilitate the team meetings, to maintain the contact with the therapeutic resource family. Um, again, we have some, some guidance around how often um, to participate in child welfare team meetings and family team meetings, as well as to provide twice monthly updates to the agency meeting child welfare. Um, they need to coordinate the services, um, including um, referrals for additional services or higher level of care referrals if, if that becomes necessary. Um, they also need to coordinate respite to include one weekend a month for each resource family. Next. Um, the skill builder's responsibilities are again to follow the plan developed by the therapist to provide you know, three to six hours per week of, um, of skill building, um, again, following that plan. We have a visit supervisor who will be the one in charge of um, supervising the visits as agreed upon with child welfare on, on what that all looks like and to coordinate that. Next slide. The responsibilities of the family, the therapeutic family home. You need to maintain your license as a resource home according to agency licensing requirements and to provide the day-to-day -day care and supervision of the youth, to work with the treatment team, um, meet with child welfare staff at least once a month, work with the OCFS and to transition the child back to the birth parents, pre-adoptive home or other permanent placement as decided, um, and ensure the case manager has all the necessary information to keep child welfare up to date on appointment school as appropriate. Um, and also to upload the medical and mental health summaries to the resource parent portal within 30 days of the appointment. Um, and meet with the therapeutic agency to discuss strengths and challenges and identifying any training needs or professional development for the home. Next. The program director is the high level management of the treatment teams um, to ensure that if and when a child needs a higher level of care, agency personnel will provide the in-home services, the facilitation and the communication. Um, to include crisis intervention, team management, transportation, to help make sure that this youth's needs are met, um, as well as the technical stuff of reportable events um, and the a plan for recruitment and retention of homes and quality assurance of those homes. Next. So <clears throat> some training requirements um, for the agency needs to maintain their licensing both clinically and regulatory, and we are asking that they all have some trauma-informed care training. Mm -hmm. The therapeutic homes, we're asking they'll be training as needed to maintain their licensing as they are now. We are asking that they be triple P trained so um, that the parents themselves have participated in the triple P parenting. Um, 
and that they also have some trauma-informed care, care training. And any other training is recommended by the agency. Nope, you're good, go ahead, you're good. So now we're switching gears. Um, so this was all for the regular therapeutic foster care. Now we're moving into the therapeutic intensive home eligibility. So again, this is regardless of custody status, they have to be at a high level of care and would benefit from being the only treatment child living in the resource home. So therapeutic foster care Oregon model is one child per home. Um, and so, but all other licensing rules would apply. They would be licensed resource families. Um, again, we're gonna use the Cal Locus CASI scoring um, to determine eligibility. And the other important factor is that this youth must have an identified discharge family in order to be admitted to the service. There has to be a plan for this youth on where they're going next. Next. So as you'll see, the intensive home um, team is similar, um, although slightly different than the therapeutic foster care team. So we have a team leader, we have a family therapist, we have a youth therapist, we have a consult, a trainer, we have skills coaches, as well as parent daily report caller and therapeutic resource family. Next. So the team leader responsibility is again, very, very similar. Um, their, work, their job is to sort of keep everybody together and working together um, and to oversee and integrate the team activities. Um, they also run weekly resource parent support groups and weekly clinical meetings. Um, they resolve any disputes amongst the team members. Next. So part of the um, ther therapeutic intensive home model is um, this sort of combined role. Um, and, and there's nothing to say that this role all has to be done by one person, although oftentimes it is. The resource parent consult recruiter trainer, their job is to really work with prospective resource parents, um, make sure that they are a good fit for the model and help work them through the necessary training and certification. Um, they also advocate for the resource parents in the program and they sort of are their voice. Um, they will conduct home visits available as phone by phone for support as needed. Um, they would help um, make sure that any concerns get up to the team leader. There's also a requirement through this model that the resource families participate in a call every day. Um, and so they go through a list of behaviors and and basically rate the behaviors for the last 24 hours. And so this is a 30 minute call that occurs daily for each home as part of this model. Next. The skills coaches, again, are working with the youth to utilize the skills that they need to in order to be um, successful in moving forward to their next, um, their, back to their permanent home or their biological family, whichever is appropriate. Um, the family therapist is going to work with the family um, where the child is returning home to. So they will do the visits either in the biological family or if the if this is a child welfare youth, perhaps in the permanent um, planned family. And so they will work with that family to develop the skills and to maintain continuity of care from the youth from the therapeutic home to the home in which the youth will be returning. And this starts on day one of entry. Next. The youth therapist really works with the youth and, and the skill builders to develop a plan um, for this youth. They're available to the youth via phone and when they need it, they attend the clinical meetings, really helping this youth develop coping and social skills and practicing those skills. Next. So the, the training is all provided um, through the TFCO organization. Um, and this is sort of an outline of that expectation of the training um, from this organization. Therapeutic intensive homes receive 12 to 14 hours um, of pre-service training in this model, in addition to the regular OCFS RFIT training um, that exists. They also have access to program staff for backup and support 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Next. So the therapeutic resource families are individually selected and trained in this model. They, they do have access to 24 seven support. They are required to do the daily PDR calls um, as outlined before. 
Um, and the TFCO consultant will help monitor their progress and how they're doing and, and additional training may be provided to the family as, as needed. Next. I will turn this over to Dwayne. All right. Um, so with the proposed rate models, um, each youth or child that is served by the program is going to receive um, two payments. They're going to receive a payment for each child from main care, and they're also going to receive a payment for each child from the Office of Fa uh, Children and Family Services. So the main care rate is going to vary by location. Um, so we're going to have a urban, rural, and super rural rate. Those zip codes are defined using the same methodology as is used for ambulance services to outline um, where whether or not an agency is located in um, one of those categories. Uh, the main care rate covers agency staffing and other costs. Um, <clears throat> all payments, including mileage, are going to be made to the agency, and then the agency will disperse the funds to the parents that are providing the services. Uh, OCF rates. Um, vary by child, uh, age of child or youth. Uh, there's more um, that's going to be coming on the slides about that. Um, the rates cover clothing, room, and board amounts paid to the agency and passed to the parents, reimbursement for respite services um, for a weekend a month um, that will also be paid to the agency uh, and passed on to the respite family. Um, and then OCFS will also reimburse agency expenses related to youth activities. Uh, and they're going to be uh, reimbursed through invoice and not in the rate. So that's going to be another payment that uh, OCFS will make when invoices are sent to them for the activities. Uh, activities will support community integration uh, determined by the therapeutic, determined to be therapeutically necessary, uh, which is a going to be identified in the uh, individualized treatment plan for the child. So here are the rates, the urban, rural, super rural, as you can see for therapeutic foster care, as well as the therapeutic intensive homes. The main care, the current main care rates, as you can see, uh, 117.57, and you can see how that compares to the new rates based on the percentage increase. Um, that's for therapeutic foster care. So I don't see that for the intensive homes. Well, the intensive homes is new. Um, next slide. Here's a breakdown of the rates from the previous page. So the agency portion of the rate based on the staffing, which is going to be on uh, slides later in the presentation, the 128.97 for therapeutic foster care uh, and the therapeutic homes 175.36. Then we have the urban, um, rural, and super rural mileage additions. Um, the assumptions are listed below there: 10 miles, one round trip a week, or 20 miles uh, per child. And then uh, 30 miles for the rural, 50 miles for the super rural. Uh, additionally, we have the other received, uh, other reimbursement to parents, um, the 41.76 and 101.14, um, which will be what gets sent to the agency and then passed through to the parents. I will turn it back over to uh, Elena for these slides. So this will become a little clearer, I think, on the next slide. So um, main care is going to contribute um, their share, and then OCFS is going to contribute a share um, as well. And so this is the rates that OCFS is going to contribute to this. And so... Um, you'll see that there is um, a respite cost built in to the rate for both models for one weekend per month um, that a respite family would be um, paid. And then um, 
the clothing allowances are the current clothing allowances that are exist today, um, or at least at the time this was developed, things are always changing. Um, and then the base rate of sort of 26, 25. So the total up at the top that you're seeing where it says total is a combination of the correct age plus the 26, 25 plus the appropriate um, reimbursement for um, the OCFS's portion of the respite. So next slide. So what do the parents receive, the therapeutic parents receive daily? Um, and the answer depends on the age. Um, and you'll see that the total rate for therapeutic foster care for a zero to three would be 69.53. For four to 11 would be 748, for 11 to 20 would be 7168. And obviously the next column is the therapeutic intensive home rates. Um, again, so this is the amount that would be Pat, the total amount, both the contribution coming from ma main care and the contribution coming from OCFS um, to the families doing who are taking care of the youth. Um, so the math is up there if you, um, would like to see it. So uh, hopefully that makes sense to so the family itself. This is the amount passed on to them. Okay, so as uh, I had stated earlier, um, this is the agency breakdown um, from before uh, the total rate 128.97 that you can see at the end of uh, the far column. It breaks down the positions, the number of FTEs associated, and then the BLS code used for the skill builder. It uses three different codes uh, as a percentage of work um, that is expected that they would be doing. Um, the wage uh, through 1125 there is from the May 2022 BLS data that's inflated by 15.202%. To get to that rate of pay, uh, then the salary is annualized. We add in the benefit percentage um, to get a total annual staffing costs. We rolled in then the training and certification, subtotal and annual costs. Uh, and then we assume 10 uh, homes per team for 3,650 days to get a total per diem rate. And then additionally, we added on 30% for admin supports and program supports. And that's how we arrived to the 128.97 rate. <clears throat> we followed the same philosophy um, for the homes. And here you can see the various positions as well with the FTEs, what BLS codes we used, the percentages to get to those rates still inflated from May 2022 by that same 15.02%. Um, and as you can see, just like the previous uh, therapeutic foster care model, it breaks it down to the 175.36. I believe uh, yep, I see that. passing this to Jessica. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, well, we got through those slides pretty quickly. So that was a lot of information presented to you in a very short amount of time. So um, I'm glad to see that I have several questions to already ask in the chat. Some have already been answered in the chat. Thank you, Becky. Um, I just want to go over quickly how uh, to raise your hand. I uh, will take call on people in the order that their hand is raised. Um, so if we could, although we do have some extra time today because we got through the slides, um, try to uh, limit your time for your questions. Um, I am capturing the chat, although we would like you to follow up with a written comment, um, not just um, having something in the chat as your official comment or question. In order to raise your hand, please go to those reactions or participants from the controls at the bottom of your screen and raise your hand. If you're on a telephone, please press star nine. Um, and if you are on a key, um, a tablet, <laughs> you might have to hit Alt-Y um, in order to raise your hand and then use the on or off 
option. Um, Ellen, I see that you have your hand raised. We'll take Ellen's question and then I will read a couple of the questions in the chat. Hi, this is really Pete Plummer. I'm sitting here with Ellen. We're not trying to trick oh. you. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> My question is, you had uh, the various rates based upon location, urban, rural, and very rural. And, and you said it's based upon the address of the agency. Is it the address of the home or the address of the agency that would establish those rates? Is Dwayne or David? In that question, um, we, uh, we are establishing it as the address of the agency. Okay. 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 Thank you. We just wanted a clarification for that. Okay. A, a question I'm going to read from the chat. Um, will the foster parents um, be allowed reimbursement of both rates when the child is on respite? That's the first half of the question. And um, the second half is do respite providers need to be therapeutic foster care? Um, I was looking for Alina or Becky to maybe answer that. Dean, someone? Do you want me to take that? I can take that. <laughs> um, the foster parents would continue to receive the rate while the youth is in respite. Um, and then I've already forgotten the second half of the question, Jessica. <laughs> yep, that's okay. It's uh, do the respite providers need to be therapeutic foster care? Um, I'm presuming that means like, are, do they also have to have the same certifications? Um, if not, Denise, you can um, clarify that. Um, for TFCO, they do utilize their additional parents. That's part of, of how that model works. So yes, for TFCO, um, I think there's probably room for some more discussion for TFC. I would defer to Becky on that. Um, we, the, the sort of a, a follow-up question down below was would the one week and a month be replacing the two weeks a year? So the, the answer is is yes, because we really want to bolster the TFC program and make it more supportive for both resource parents and more therapeutic for children. So most likely respite providers are going to need to be um, also licensed and trained the same as TFC providers so that the child is getting that continuity of care and the respite providers are really like an extended member of that team. I'm gonna go ahead and call on Dale. And I know you also had a question in the chat. Dale? Yeah, so um, first question is just to follow up to David around um, choosing an agency location versus the foster home since the payment is tied to the foster parents, not the, the agency in those cases, um, what the rationale is. And then in the chat, um, you, the, the rate is determined based on 10 homes. Um, is that really 10 homes or is that 10 children, um, which is a huge difference in terms of um, resource allocation. Um, sure, um, so on the uh, mileage question first, um, this, uh, our, our rationale is, is partly just um, what are our systems able to handle and, and um, what do we receive on a claim that the agency submits to us? Um, so uh, it is easier for us to get the information about the, the ages, agency's address on a claim uh, where we don't really wanna register every single home as a, a separate service location. Um, so we need to be able to identify the information on the claim to be able to, to make sure that we're uh, appropriately um, reimbursing, whether it's the urban, rural, or super rural. So uh, that's that's kind of a, a technical aspect for um, why we chose to use the, the agency location. Um, and then on the... Uh, 10 homes or 10 children question. Uh, it is um, 10 homes that we have assumed. Um, 
and again, uh, this is um, that 10 home assumption was uh, to um, was to, to uh, build in to, to figure out how to allocate those costs to billable units. Um, so for the therapeutic intensive home model, uh, I believe um, there is only one youth per home. Um, so that that question is a little moot on the um, TIH side. Um, on the TFC side, I think um, there are situations where more than one youth would be in a home at a time. Um, and uh, and I think from the provider's perspective, uh, like we're, we're not limiting your ability to bill additional units for additional youth. Um, so even though the assumption uh, has fewer, uh, fewer billable units, we're, we're spreading the cost among fewer billable units um, your ability to, to bill uh, the additional units if there are multiple youth in that home uh, allows you to get uh, adequate reimbursement for any additional child. Thank you, David. Um, before I call on you, Hannah, I just wanted to answer this one, uh, ask this one question in the chat uh, by Denise, um, uh, stated diaper allowance. I'm going to look to someone in OCFS to answer that question. Is there currently a diaper allowance or how is that being considered? We currently, we currently have a diaper allowance. I think it's pretty automatic for children zero to two. And then we can extend that for children over the age of two that require the diaper allowance. Um, we didn't include that in the in the TFC um, rate um, <clears throat> that and anything that main care would play, but if that's um, if that's a need, OCFS would continue to pay that. Thank you, um, Hannah. Um, so if I have a so like if somebody has a level E child in their home currently, they would either need to become a therapeutic intensive family or go down the level. Is that the case? We're not. We're not prepared at this point to talk about how things are going to move forward with the, with the changing of the existing level. So there's more to okay. come on. Okay. And then the the respite. So we, we would need to do one weekend a month instead of the two weeks a year. I think, I just think it's really a family choice, whether they want to take one vacation a year or a weekend. And it just, it would be a, a, st a stumbling block for a lot of people. Um, thank you, Hannah, for that question. Um, I think Alina's saying that they're gonna they're look still looking at that, and um, you can feel free to um, write that, and I will put my email in the chat, and then we can address that as a comment when we respond to comments. Um, I had one. Oh, Denise, are you gonna ask your? I was gonna. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to ask your chat question. Oh, I, I'm also asking, um, do medical children fall into this or is this still outside of this? This is this is still not for medical for medical children. This is for behavioral health needs, mental health and trauma. And an additional question from the chat was, um, are we requiring social workers to have their L LSWs? I mean, that would be, I believe that's an agency question, but if we're referring to the breakout of how, what codes we used for the wages uh, from the BLS, um, we we worked with the program team to try to find what would be the most appropriate um, codes used. So just because something is a social worker on the codes we're using from BLS doesn't automatically mean that they have to be an LCSW or LSW for the role. I mean, I think that's kind of program will decide. So I defer to Dean and Elena for the answer to whether or not those are going to be required. But from a BLS, uh, you know, categories perspective, we chose the um, 
codes that made the most sense uh, for the services provided. So there are positions on in both programs that would require LCSWs, um, the therapist positions. There are positions that require LSWs, the um, case manager position. Um, and so uh, as an example, so there will be specific licensing requirements for those positions. Thank you for that, uh, answering that question. Um, do we have any other questions at this time? I wanted to add while people are thinking of questions is that um, in the slide presentation, uh, one small change in the mileage reimbursement is going to be, um, it's calculated on the federal, current federal reimbursement rate of 0.655 um, going forward. I didn't see anything in the TFC model about 24-7 on-call support. Is that going to be part of the TFC model going forward as it is now? That silly mute button. Yes, that is the plan that there would be 24-7 support ongoing as there is now. Yep. Thank you. Dale? With the uh, TFCO model, um... Are you looking to RFP that where there will be um, a limited number of providers in the state or are you um, leaving that open to providers and how are you addressing the issue of ongoing fidelity costs as staff change within those organizations? So I think there will be um Avail the initial training will, will be available. We will, um, OCFS will provide that and we're working out the details on exactly what that will look like through TFCO. The ongoing costs are um, figured into the rate and we're part of the calculations. But no, the plan is not to RFP it to a specific number unless I would think we would run into an issue where we had more people interested than we think we will. So Dean, I'll defer to you. Yeah, I mean, thanks, Dale, for the question. Um, you know, we're we're definitely looking at this as an any willing and qualified. Um, we did have um, a budget initiative approved through the legislature this past session um, to put forth training um, for any interested providers in the TFCO model, and so we do have that available. Um, and so we will be releasing more details as we, you know, finalize our contracts and get all those, you know, um, kind of pieces put into place. But um, you know, we we absolutely, you know, have the ability to train interested providers in the TFCO model, you know, from the get go. And then, yeah, as Alina mentioned, you know, the the, the thought is, which is I think pretty consistent with, um, you know, other services and rate models, is to have you know the ongoing cost of fidelity and uh, potential turnover, things like that, um, built into the rate. Can you? Can you provide so that we can comment accurately um, that what you expect the number of children who would qualify at that level um, and the number of children that would qualify that by that level um, by county? Um, because part of the factor you you're using the ten homes as an assumption, um, and that may or may not hold depending on your data. Um, the model itself. Uh, we know because we've provided this in the past, is very expensive around the fidelity. And if the capacity in terms of the number of youth participating in it, based on the way you're designing the model, doesn't pan out, um, it is not a something that would be affordable. So having that data to give you um, reasonable um, and fair feedback is, is critical. Thanks, Dale. I think that's something we can work on. Yeah, and I think just, you know, for this this particular model, it just you have to remember it is open to both, you know, kids are in um kids are in foster care, um, and then kids who are not. And so it will be some of those um JCCO kids, it'll be some of those kids that um, you know, CBH is working with in the community, it'll be kids who are on wait lists for residential programs. It's an alternative to residential. Um, so it does open up the eligibility for who, um, you know, who could qualify for this 
versus um, how it was offered, you know, in the past. Thank you. Um, Denise? When you said the term, um, this title of LCSW, are you also including LCPCs and LMFTs and LMSWs? Yes, I just rounded the term to first brevity shape, but yes, yeah. Hannah? So is the goal of the, the higher level, the therapeutic or intensive therapeutic homes, is that would that be a short term goal to have them there short term rather than so that, I mean assuming that's what it means when you have a backup you have someone for there to go afterwards yeah this is an evidence-based treatment model so this is a you go there for treatment with the plan to return to somewhere um, as designated so this is this is not a plan <laughs> the evidence-based model is six to nine months and that right is Sorry. the plan so, to state that so that would assume that the kid has a prognosis or a, a ability to get better to a better state of functioning so what are we what about kids with um you know developmental disabilities who their needs are constantly high it's not going to get better over time I mean it could it can improve but it's not ever going to be a typical functioning or you know whatever stuff like that how how will those kids be served? Will they still be in therapeutic foster care or where does I think that it would lie? depend on, I think it's gonna depend on the youth. If they have a extremely high need that at the time that there's something that could be helped or the parents could receive some additional training on how to manage that, the TFCO program might be appropriate for that youth because the parents would receive that additional sort of coaching, the parents which the youth was going back to, whether that's a regular TFC home or a bio home or, or wherever that child is planned to go to, that part of the TFC model is really working with those parents to develop the skills to then manage that youth. So that youth may then go back to a therapeutic foster care provider who's received some additional training and can manage it. It may be Aunt Sally who has received the additional training and now is in a better position to manage it. But it is a short term um, treatment with the goal to both help the youth stabilize, but also provide that extremely intensive training to the parent to be able to manage that youth. And so that's the little bit different sort of take on this model, if that makes sense. Okay, um, Ellen? Ellen, which I know might not really be Ellen. Yeah, this is, it's, it's Pete again with, with okay. Ellen. Uh, we're, we're sitting here together. My, my question is, uh, do you guys have a timeline of when all these changes will occur? I'm sure it's going to have to go through rulemaking and, and, and you know, a whole process. And and, and, uh, and I was just wondering, is this like a, a three-month thing, a six-month thing, or, you know, to, to make the change? Uh, do you guys have any any thoughts on that? Yeah, I can speak to this. Um... Um, my name is Henry Eckerson. I'm the Children's and Behavioral Health Policy Manager. I'll be overseeing uh, the rulemaking. Um, we're hoping to start the rulemaking um, kind of likely late winter or in the spring um, and uh, hopefully adopt the rule in the fall. These are very tentative timelines. Um, there's certainly a lot of factors at play. So um, that is what we are hoping for. Uh, I can't be more specific at this time. Thanks. Thank you, Henry. Denise? You talked about a child um, waiting for the leveling type process for 30 to 60 days. So how will the determination be made uh, where that child goes in the meantime? Are you going to be placing them into a home the TFCO home with the prospect that they may level out at that, or they may be in a home that already has two kids, but the child levels out at that, but can't be because there's two kids in the home. We run into this problem now often. Children are taken out of resident or leave residential or hospital 
and are because they're not coming directly from a place that they've already been leveled they're often placed in inappropriate placements in the meantime while you're waiting for a leveling how will this well, change that so I don't want to get into the specifics of leveling because there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. I will say that this does this leveling is about gather the 30 to 60 days is to get the information together. So a kid coming out of a residential should have a level, a kid coming out of um, somewhere else. The kids initially entering foster care will need a, a plan for those and, and that'll get worked out as we move forward. Um, but there's nothing for a child who's already currently in a system or in a home this leveling should happen really quickly. Thank you, Alina. At this time, there's no more questions in the chat. I want to um, thank you. Um, I have a couple more hands up. That's great. Um, David, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, so, I just want to get a sense of the process. This is a public hearing. Um, and could someone walk uh, walk me through or walk us through the timeline for responses? And then I may have another question after that. Sure. Um, responses to the question. So in one of the previous slides, uh, we are giving two weeks. Uh, so comments and questions are due to my email address, which I will post in the chat um, by December 20th. And then we look at the responses, we write written, um, write written responses to that and post it on our website. And we there are times that those comments or responses uh, do affect some changes to rates or some methodologies. So that's all considered. So can I give you a specific time frame in which they'll be in there? Not an exact time frame, but we do post them on the website and we have the comments addressed before the final rates because we consider that before we do our final rates. Do you have anything to add to that, David? Y yes, thank you. So, um... So this process, because and, and the reason I ask this question is um, there's there's a lot of once we get these slides, I, I suspect there's going to be a lot of different questions, which will then have responses from you, which will then probably have more questions because um, this is a I think everyone would agree this is a pretty significant redesign. Um, and it affects a lot of existing placements and children and homes that we certainly don't want to lose any of because we need lots more. Um, so I think we have to go about this very carefully, not to mention all of the staff that appear to be possibly in a situation of having to change roles because of the various criteria. So there's a lot of... Um, we got to change a lot of wheels here while the bike's going down the road. And I just want to be cautious that we're getting all these questions answered because people are going to start getting a little bit wiggy out there um, when this starts becoming public, it, 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 you know, including our existing staff. So I just want to make sure we have everything laid out so we can help them understand um, sort of the next steps. Um, I'm not sure if Dean or David. I can maybe, well, speak to oh. some of it um, a little bit as well. I, so there will be obviously the opportunity right now for you to comment on um, the rate model itself. Um, and that's the, the December uh, 20th date that Jessica is referring to. Um, and then you will have the opportunity. It, I don't, I don't know if the scope of your question um, extends to this, but during the rulemaking phase, at least on the main care side, you'll have the opportunity again, there will be, um, there will be a public comment period in which you'll be able to comment on the rule itself um, and the service model. Um, and there, so there will be a, a common period, another public hearing for that. So, um, you know, any, uh, any of your questions um, kind of related to service model provider requirements, staffing requirements, et cetera, um, there'll, there'll be another opportunity for you um, to comment and ask your questions 
during the rulemaking phase. I don't know if Dean or David wants to add anything to that. Well, I definitely appreciate the, you know, I think very thoughtful, you know, comment, David. And, you know, I think for any of us that are looking to, you know, support, um, you know, some model revisions, we don't want to do something that's going to be so severely disruptive that it will, you know, really negatively impact the service delivery. You know, our, our hope through, you know, this process is to, you know, be able to expand and enhance, uh, not, uh, you know, kind of make things, um, you know, potentially worse. And so, you know, with that, um, I think it'll be really important for, you know, you and, you know, the colleagues on the call here to really take a look at those slides once they're out there. Think about what your questions may be. Definitely submit them. Um, and as, you know, it. I would say submit them as it relates to the service model, you know, and submit them as it relates to the actual rates. Um, you know, I think from the rate study perspective, um, you know, and David, you know, please jump in. I'm, I'm kind of spitballing um, a little bit, but you know, the 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 rate determination process is really focused on rate development. And so um, where there's, you know, questions that are related to model, I think those are things that our team, you know, collectively can take back and consider and think about what, you know, potential next steps or further conversations may need to be, um, you know, kind of based on what those questions are, um, and then loop back as it relates to the um, you know, rate to see if there's any kind of impact um, as, as we kind of sort through. Um, so that's just sort of my initial thinking, David. Um, you know, I'm interested in your thoughts, but, you know, as the rate determination process is, it's focused on rate development. Certainly understanding model is, is a big part of that. And so, um, and, and may have an influence. There might be, you know, future conversations, you know, or correspondence that we could have, you know, even maybe outside the rate determination process. Yeah. And and certainly um, we understand there has to be a transition process in this. We can't go from this one day to this to the next. At, once we get through, you know, um, through this, then we'll have to, um, there's a, you know, like you said, a, you know, we have to sort of build this as we're going down the road. There's a lot of things on our end that we need to do. You know, the main care piece is one piece, but the program is another. Um, you know, we have to look at our goals and things like that too. So we'll, we'll be starting to build out some of those things, um, you know, on, on our end, again, while the main care is, you know, going down this road, we've got our own, um, you know, road that's going beside it. So there, we know this is um, a big piece, but definitely transition planning is part of that. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move on to um, another question. Uh, Shannon? Yes. Um, prior to a child being in a TFC or TIH home, who would be doing the Colocus Cassie assessment? It said independent agency. I, I didn't know what that was referring to. That is all going to get worked out, and the, I'm sure there'll right. be lots more conversations. That's why it was worded like that. So we have a lot of work to do, as Becky has already said, about how to transition, how to do the, um, the tool, and and all of that. The be chances we want to hear we don't we didn't come with a total plan for all like that's going to all need to be figured out with everybody else sort of having some input so there's there's okay. a lot of work to be done on that front okay thanks I, I think we can say you know at least we we do currently engage with the centra on the um uh residential side so our um, pnmi appendix d uh, children's residential care facilities um they uh, conduct those assessments on our behalf So for any youth that are like looking to transition down, you know, from a, the, the residential level of care to a potential TFC or TFCO, you know, I think we could, you know, certainly leverage, you know, the existing process that we already have, but certainly some decisions, you know, are looking to be made about, um, you know, who we're going to utilize for this work um, moving forward. Thank you, Dean. Ellen, possibly Peter. Possibly, yeah. So, yes, thank you. Uh, first, I want to thank you guys for sharing the uh, agreement to share the slides. That, that'll be helpful because it's hard to kind of keep up with everything. My, my, my question is related to the rate study 
you know, there were snippets of it, you know, within the slides. Is that is that totally comprehensive of, of the rape study that, that was done that would come up with it? Is there is there something deeper that, that could be shared that, that we could use to help us model, you know, the, the service and and the question that I had, you know, it's centered around 10 homes. What what if an HC has like 16 homes or 23 homes? Uh, you can't really divide by 10 easily. And and would there be any differences if you if your number of homes that you would divide by 10 evenly? Uh, or that's my question, I guess. Thank you. So before rate setting jumps in, I just want to be clear that TFCO does have sort of team requirements and and does limit as part of their evidence based model the number of homes. That's not the same for TFC, but it but it is part of the TFCO model. So um, a maximum number of homes. So anyway, I'll turn and that you over. Could, rate setting. You, agencies could have more than one set of ten team homes, right? Because ten teams like. 10 homes make a team. You could have two teams or, you know, again, in hopefully in different geographical areas. And I, I also think that there's, no, if need be, if, if this was a rural area, I would think that there is some, there, there was discussion about there being room for, you know, perhaps a clinician to have ad additional sort of caseload stuff if that was needed. There's nothing that's going to prohibit that per se moving forward. It would just be that the service is the primary requirement. So, so if you had, had a, a caseload of say 25, you would have two full teams, and you would have five additional, you know, consumers or homes. Could you like have half of a of a team, you know, maybe not have a whole social worker, just just a half, because if you had to have a whole team, you couldn't you couldn't do that. Yeah, I'm thinking based with, with a rate study based on or a rate determination based on a certain level of FTEs serving an X number of homes. Obviously, we understand that you wouldn't be able to run a third team only billing for five homes. Um, the funding wouldn't be there for that to be possible. So yeah, partial FTEs with overage, I think would be would be appropriate. Yeah. And that was the thought moving forward as far as programmatic end too, that you may have people half dedicated to this program or or however you needed to make it work. That's just as long as the requirements for this program for the families and for the youth were being met. Thank you. Um, Hannah? You said a couple times that the, the TIH homes would have one child. Are you you talking about um, one child and maybe whatever kids they have in their home, or is this just a single parents only kind of thing? No, it's one treatment child. They one treatment one. child. What about siblings? I understand it's not just for foster children, but if they have no. siblings, no. No, it is one treatment child per home. For that service okay. again, that service is focused right. around the treatment yeah. of that youth. It is not a long-term home for children. Okay. To be in. Um, how how many of those homes do we interest? Like, I know this is a way, probably way too specific, but how many of those homes do you anticipate needing? Just because I I want to call like one thing that makes me really angry as a foster parent is getting paid a lower level of care than what the child needs. Um, so I currently have a therapeutic foster child that I don't get paid therapeutic level for because he's not my, he's, he's an emergency kiddo. But if I have, if I'm a, have a, if I'm a therapeutic foster family and I have a kid that needs a THI home in my home and I'm getting paid less and getting less support because those homes are not available, we're just, I think you just need to be aware of the fact that um, that's really how we disengage people by having this level that's unobtainable um, because it's not available and still expecting them to do the work for less money with less support. Um, and also therapeutic foster homes are not going to hold beds for kids in TIH. I can't afford to do that. I don't know anyone who could. Um, so I don't, I just don't know how that would work. 
I think that would need to get figured out. And I think the goal is not to make it a service that's not accessible. So can I promise that we'll have every bed for every child every time? No. Um, but if you do look at the rates, I think what we did try to do was bolster the rates significantly and increase the support for regular therapeutic foster care to make sure that you are getting additional support and what we feel is a fair rate for some pretty high needs children. So I'm hoping that that will help make that better. Oh um, yeah, it, it definitely does. And I'm not, I'm not complaining. I'm just like, I'm, I'm thinking like, yeah, no, there's a lot of stuff that has to get figured out yeah. and there's a lot more work that has to be done and, and there will be certainly room to have those discussions and please submit your concerns because we do want to plan around them. Okay. Dale? Uh, so I just want to echo what's been said in terms of thanking you for host hosting this and providing the information. This isn't a, a question so much about the content, just about the process, um, because I'm not really clear. This is, is this an informal process where you're trying to gather some initial reaction to inform the next part, um, or is this the formal process? And the reason I ask that is, as far as the APA is concerned, you can't set, this isn't setting a rate for an existing service. You're talking about changing a rule which requires that content to be developed and put out for comment. And the rate supports that model. Um, and what you're asking us to do is to comment on the rate without seeing the content of the model. So I just really want to understand the process in terms of what today is about um, and the rule, um, I'm assuming you're changing either section 97 or you're creating a new section, um, which would have this content, which is part of that APA and, and the rate is specific to that. So um, when that happens, the change that could come from the result of the APA process could change the rate methodology. Um, the rate is based on the assumptions that everything that you've presented today will play itself out. So can someone speak about the process, the APA process, what today is about, so that I just have a better clarity around um, the extent to which we should be commenting. Yeah, so I'll I'll take a first step at this and then I'll ask uh, Henry to chime in again. Um, today's process is not about rulemaking. Today's process is not uh, APA. Uh, today's process is a formal process, but it is governed by our rate reform statute. Um, so the, the, this rate determination uh, needs to be followed by rulemaking. Uh, we can't change the rate without doing rulemaking. So uh, the work that we're doing today is to, to establish the rate methodology first so that we can bring that rulemaking forward into that future rulemaking. So uh, the comments um, from a main care perspective uh, that we want to be in this in today's formal process, the, the comments um, that are due by December 20th are specific to this rate determination process and uh, and will inform the rate model that that we will kind of formalize um, and then bring forward into the rulemaking process. Uh, Henry, would you add anything to that? Yeah, to address the other part of the question, we're going to re repeal um, therapeutic foster care services from Section 97 and stand up a new section of policy specifically for TFC and TIH. Um, there, you know, we, we'll obviously propose um, you know, the, the rule will essentially contain the service model in it. Although I think this, the slides presented today um, kind of capture the essence of that already. Um, so I, I think, you know, we're, we're aiming to solidify the rate model um, so that we can move forward with the rule. Now, if, the, if there are comments um, during the rulemaking that change the service model and a, that that are you know we that we agree upon and change the service model in a significant way, then we could reassess um, the underlying rate model uh, again during the rulemaking phase. I guess I just a clarity on that. You, you, 
<clears throat> you're saying the rate model, but the what you're presenting is not a rate based on the existing service delivery system. You are you've developed a rate based on a lot of assumptions about changes that you have yet to post or publish. And you just so I the rate determination process, the, that rule deals with existing uh, statutes, existing rules in terms of how you arrive at at those rates. How do you arrive at a rate that doesn't have a specific defined model in statute? Maybe I'll let David take that one. I, I can also speak after if needed. Yeah, uh, so our, our rate reform statute does not just govern um, existing uh, policies. It, it also governs um, future policies that we want to propose. So if we're proposing something new, we also need to go through this rate determination process. And uh, so with a new service model, we also need to develop a, a new reimbursement model to go along with that. Um, I, I understand your point that if, if you have um, questions and comments about the service model, you may not know whether the reimbursement model is appropriate. So uh, we, we definitely encourage you to like voice those comments and, and submit those formally. If, if, uh, if you think that um, the staffing assumptions that we've laid out um, if, if you just don't understand if those will adequately uh, fit the service model, um, feel free to submit those comments. And um, between OMS and OCFS, we'll, we'll triage the, the bulk of those questions and take those into account uh, as we, as we uh, decide whether to, to refine the model further uh, or incorporate any of those comments that, that you might have. Yeah, and I think that's what I was kind of speaking to earlier. And so, you know, when when you, when you're looking at the slides, when you're thinking about things in the context of certainly the the, the rate model and, and and this discussion, recognize that there is model development also going on there. And so, please do submit your questions or thoughts, you know, concerns based off of the actual you know delivery model. And then I think once we have, you know, kind of those collectively, you know, we can also take a look and decide what a, an appropriate next step would be, um, whether we, you know, potentially need to have, you know, a further conversation to, you know, talk things through, or, you know, if through the context of the question, you've given us enough to, you know, kind of sink our teeth into to make some decisions, you know, kind of based off of that comment. Um, w without seeing the comments, I can't exactly know what the next step is going to be, but I think that's something that, you know, we're, we're you know, going to be looking at depending on how the comments come in. But, you know, the ha having those questions and those points identified is going to be really helpful. Okay. Um, Mallory, thank you so much for your patience. <laughs> And I want to thank everyone for the uh, being so engaged in asking questions and um, please do follow up in writing so we can have those be addressed as part of our written responses. Um, Mallory? Hi, thank you. And I want to get back to what Dale was just asking about and Dave earlier on the process because we are now almost a full year into another process where there was a change to the actual service provision um, that was done through FAQs that has not been through the rules process yet with HCT and ACT, um, mm -hmm. where we had a, you know, a change in the model and a change in the rate but we never were able to get the model first before we got the rate to be able to comment on the model, get that finalized and then be able to say, okay, this is the model. Now does this rate make sense? And it seems like we're going down that path again. I appreciate, you know, the sharing this information today, but it's a lot of information for us to give any kind of a qualified you know, commentary by the 20th, we have questions that have to be answered to understand more fully what we're responding to. Um, and, and the
the concern I have is one, you know, if we are simply submitting comments and questions but have no answers to the questions, the comments are not as fully informed as they should be. And the rate reform process is supposed to have, you know, fully informed presentations and comments. <clears throat> so that's a that's a concern to me. Like, can we get questions to you and have an, you know, by the Friday and on Monday get those answers so that we can actually know what we're commenting on by the 20th? And two, to Dale's point again, you are doing both model creation and change, programmatic change, and rate change at the same time. We need to know what the model and the full details of it are, then look at the rates before we can comment on the rates. So we're doing it again in the same process, and it, it's just confusing, and I have real concerns about that. <clears throat> Does that make sense? Hi, Mallory. I think that that makes sense. I think w one thing I'll say: what what's different between um, what happened with uh, all the behavioral health changes and this rule is that there is going to be a rulemaking that's occurring before any of this is adopted and implemented. Um, <clears throat> so that will give you the chance to comment on both. Uh, the service model and the applicable rates uh, during the rulemaking process. And um, I'm sure someone else can say this better than I can, but I, you know, I think, I think the presentation does capture um, possibly the majority of the service model, or at least the, the fine details of the service model. So I think, um, you know, the you know the essence of it is is there um, to comment on, but, and you will have another you know that it will be more fleshed out during the rulemaking phase when we propose the rule, um, and you'll be able to comment on you know the full extent of the model and the requirements at that point as well. Yes, but the concern is if you're presenting a model and programmatic change. And then people get to comment on that through a rulemaking process. One assumes that there may be some changes based on the comments or why he had the process. So then you have changes to it, but you're at the same time building the rate model based on the premise and the assumptions that you have currently and not building the model first and then building the rate around that model. I, I think um, I, I would say we, you know, we we have the rate model that is presented based off of a, you know, service model assumptions. Yeah, and I will just add, uh, if, if you have concerns about any unknowns that you think will uh, impact um, what appropriate reimbursement would be. Uh, definitely please submit those comments. And uh, if it's, um, if it's, uh, if, if you have questions, clarifying questions about what we presented today, we may be able to get you answers before that comment deadline. If you have substantive questions about what we've presented today, we likely will not uh, be responding to those. Um, if, if there are substantive questions, please just submit them as uh, as formal comments in the comment process, and we'll we'll address those more formally. But um, if it's a, a matter of a clarifying question, um, we'll we'll try to get you an answer to that um, before the comment deadline, um, so that you can uh, you can adjust your your comments uh, as appropriate. Um, but again, if if you have um, if you think there are gaps in the model that need to be further fleshed out to to make sure the reimbursement is appropriate, um, please submit comments that uh, that indicate that. Okay, we can do that. Um, I just really want to again go on record as saying it is similar in that we had HPT and ACT major changes. We had to comment on the, the rate 
prior to having, you know, finalized what the exact structure and and staffing of that was. And once they all came together, the realization was that there was some real problems with it. And we're still struggling with that right now, currently, while we're waiting for the final rules to come out. But doing this in tandem like this leaves it open to that. So I just want to make sure that's on the record. And we will submit that as well. Okay, thank you, Mallory, for those concerns. And yes, please do follow up with writing so we can respond. Um, we're getting towards the end, but David has his hand up. So we're gonna take the next question from David, please. Thanks, Jessica. Um, this may be a question, Henry. Um, when, uh, when a new policy is put into place and another policy is repealed, is there a is it allowed to have a transition period meaning could section 97 as it is now be held in place um for a few months following the um publishing and operating beginning for the new policy that we're talking about the, the new service, could we have a transition period that would allow, give existing entities time to transition? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that because it's it's something that we haven't fully um, figured out, but it was it's something that we do need to discuss. Um, so uh, yeah, I don't have an answer for you at the moment, um, okay. but it is something that is, um, you know, kind of on the docket for discussion internally. All right, I appreciate that. Is that something that we should include in our questions, our list of questions? It would be appropriate for this. Um, I I don't think it's I don't think it's a relevant question as far as um like as an official comment for the rate forum. Um, but it, it's it's certainly um, yeah. I, I think you can you can consider it um kind of filed with me um, okay. because uh yeah it is again um uh, something we need to uh figure out in the near future okay thank you very much yep uh i'll just jump in and say that you know um in, in terms of the thinking as well and, and you know for awareness um in order to remove the service um you know and in, in earnest from section 97 uh, the chapter three is a major substantive uh, rule, which would need uh, legislative authority uh, to approve. And so I would think that that would add to the potential timeline of removing said service, um, you know, from, from policy. That would be independent of the creation of the new one. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, again, we have five minutes left. Um, so for any last minute questions, I am also posting um, in the chat, again, the Great Reform website that we encourage you to um, go to to find the PowerPoint presentation and the recording of today's meeting. They might be up as soon as this afternoon, uh, the recording may take a little longer as we have to wait for Zoom to send it to us. So that might not be up until tomorrow. I also encourage everybody to um, send those questions and comments so we can clarify those things that you need clarified now before December 20th. And I am posting my email in the chat um, because I would be the person you would send those to. So, um, if you could please submit your questions and comments before the 20th and um, right away, if you have a clarifying, a question we're gonna need to clarify before you can ask your follow-up question or comment. Um, no more questions in the chat. Do we have any other questions? Okay, I want to give everybody a minute to before I end the meeting to copy that information 
from the chat so it can be available to you. We will send a notice out that will contain that website link as well, but we like to give it to you ahead of time. Could be a few days before the notice goes out. Again, um, really do appreciate everybody being so engaged and asking questions and will being willing to provide the feedback so we can um, consider that as we move forward with this process. Do you have anything to add, David? Yeah, I'll, I'll just say thank you again. Um, and we we appreciate all of the, the good conversation that we've had today. And uh, we look forward to receiving your questions and comments um, in in writing. And we'll, we'll be uh, happy to engage with those soon. So thank you all. Okay. Thank you and everybody have a great day. Thank you.